we are going to be looking at what was previously called the cell membrane, but now we refer to it as the plasma membrane. And the reason is to help us understand how the, this, this cell membrane, this plasma membrane is actually pretty uh, active. It's pretty active. It can fold, uh, bits can pinch in. It's a very important way of how materials are actually brought in to the actual cell. And the reason why we call it the plasma membrane is because it's not just this part out here that's made up of this particular structure of membrane-y stuff. In fact, all these uh, membranes around here as well, if this is the Golgi apparatus, the outsides, the membrane of the Golgi apparatus is made up of the same materials that this out outer membrane is also made up of. Same thing with the endoplasmic reticulum. So whenever you imagine a picture of a cell, it looks very static, but in fact it's very dynamic. Things are pinching and moving around, and even these little uh, circular structures here, which could be vesicles and, the, and lysosomes, um, they are all made up of the same type of membrane, which allows them to interchange and move around with each other. This will best be illustrated with some kind of animation. I'll hope to attach this as well, too. So we call it the plasma membrane as opposed to the cell membrane. But keep in mind that all of these, a lot of these internal organelle structures are also surrounded by the same membrane, the structure of which we're going to look at right here with a really simplified, ugly diagram. If you type this in onto Google, uh, do a Google image search, you're going to see thousands of different images, um, and each one can look different. So your, point, your goal is not to memorize uh, how one of these diagrams actually looks, but try to pick out the specific features so no matter what, no matter what kind of format it's given to you in, you can figure out what's going on. So if I look up here, so imagine that if I take a slice through here and look at it sideways, like a cross section through. So the cell would actually extend like all the way around, okay, like this. So this big cell right here, but I'm just zooming in on one edge of the plasma membrane. You'll see that it is no longer one thin pencil line. It's actually a pretty complex looking thing. You've got these little molecules here that have a little round head with two kind of tails sticking out. You've got these big sausage-like things running all the way through. You've got small sausage things that are just on the inside of the cell or just on the outside of the cell, and some of them have little chains that are around there. You can get pretty detailed with this, and we'll go into, into detail later, but for now, let's just look at the basic parts. Every part of a cell, uh, I, I keep making a mistake too, every part of a plasma membrane is made up of primarily these molecules are the main structure, these little lollipop type things with two handles so that you and your friend can share the same lollipop. This is called a phospholipid. Why? Because the head is made up of a phosphate group, okay? There's a P in there. This is, this is simplified, of course. And then the two tails, the two tails, if I look at the actual structure over here, this should look familiar to you, okay? The tails actually look like chains of, look at that, carbon, 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 carbon. It looks like a fatty acid. It looks like a fatty acid. And you know that fatty acids make up part of the structure of lipids, so you can probably guess that these tails, if they're lipidy, if they're lipidy or fatty acidy, they probably don't like water. Phosphate, on the other hand, does like water. So if you take a look at the structure of this, notice how all the tails are facing each other and facing inside, protected from the water that, that will be surrounding the cell and the water, watery base that will be inside the cell as well too. And all the heads that are the phosphate groups like water, so they're all facing out towards the water. And this is just this is something that happens naturally. They don't make this particular decision. Just if you throw a bunch of phospholipids into water, throw a million phospholipids into water, they will naturally group up like this into spherical shapes. It's really, really interesting. And it gives us a hint about how cells first started. So if you have a lot of heads here, Okay, but each one of these is a molecule called a phospholipid consisting of one head with two tails. And you create this double layer, this bilayer structure. Make sure to get that word down, this bilayer structure. Okay, these things that are running through, these are proteins coming in different shapes. Some of them run all the way through, some of them just stick at the edges, and some of them are only going to go halfway through. If you peel it away, you can imagine what it might look like underneath. Another thing to keep in mind is that this is also, I, I mentioned before the word dynamic. So these heads, they're actually all 
kind of rolling around each other. Think of them like uh, water molecules, closely bound together, but with energy and flowing around. So if you were sitting on top of one of these guys right here, uh, by the end of the day, you might be all the way at the other end of the cell because they're constantly flowing and moving around each other. The plasma membrane is a, is a, dynamic, it's a dynamic structure. All right, so what do we need to know here? Uh, a couple words, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Well, can you tell if I pointed out this particular phospholipid here, which part is hydrophilic, which part is hydrophobic? Well, the part that likes water is going to be the phosphate head, so that part would be considered uh, hydrophilic. The part that repels water or tries to face away from water are the tails, the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid molecule. The membrane is also described as semi-permeable, which you can probably make out what that means. Another way to say it is selectively permeable. It basically uh, helps, and that's the whole purpose of a barrier. Its, its purpose is to allow some things through while preventing others from getting through. So allow some substances to pass through and prevents others from passing through. If you let everything pass through, what good are you as a, as a gate? If our security guards um, let everyone come in, they wouldn't be really doing their job, okay? But they have to allow, they have to figure out what's good and what's, what's not good. And then we're gonna see how the cells actually do that and how sometimes they make mistakes as well too. Um, a few other words for these, those red colored proteins. I, I, I've just colored them red here, but you can probably figure out what's going on. Um, if they run all the way through, there's a few names for them. If they run all the way through, we can say that they are transmembrane. In other words, they go across the membrane, not too hard. Or you can say they are intrinsic, intrinsic proteins as well, too. The ones that stick to the outside uh, have different names. You can call them peripheral proteins, as it's shown here, really, really small. Or you can use the opposite of intrinsic. You can say extrinsic proteins as well, too. And they have different functions. The ones that go through usually have a function of helping to move things across the membrane. So ones that go through can, well, it's like a little tunnel. You can help things to bring molecules inside, or you can help to bring molecules outside. The ones that are not going all the way through, obviously, unless they're trying to be mean tunnels to trick things, haha, you thought you could go through, but you cannot, are, will have different functions. I'll outline a few, just list a few of them in a, in a moment here. Um, other molecules can, some molecules could actually squeeze between uh, the phospholipids and go all the way through, but that's going to come up next when we talk about different ways things can get transported across. So here are the names again, uh, integral, transmembrane, I also said intrinsic as well, and then proteins that don't extend through are extrinsic or peripheral. Uh, they basically act like a tunnel that allow large molecules like glucose to get through or some ions, and more about that will be coming up later. Here's another, so you can easily hand draw a diagram. That's a point that I want to make as well too. That's something you should be able to do is to draw a circle. Each one of these circles has two tails sticking out and I can draw a big protein and then imagine that uh, something has to pass through the middle. And I can label all this stuff. Phospholipid, phosphate head, uh, hydrophobic tails, hydrophilic head, transmembrane protein. This could be a glucose molecule, something that's trying to pass all the way through. Okay, a few other things uh, are in there as well too. So really quickly, this I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Some of those proteins, besides being obvious things like uh, channels or pumps that help things to get through, they could be binding sites for hormones. So when hormones get secreted and they get passed through your bloodstream, they can actually bind to particular cells, bind to particular cells to cause that cell to do something. So how do they bind? Well, they can be looking for a particular binding spot. So some of these proteins could be hormone binding spots. Some of them could be enzymes. You should know what enzymes are. Um, amylase is an important one. But in many important biological uh, reactions, including those involved in respiration, there are plenty of enzymes involved. And some of those will actually be stuck in various cell membranes. Some could be electron carriers, where they basically are transferring electrons from one place to another. Let's not go into that later. You'll learn about that when we talk about photosynthesis and other uh, functions, and re especially respiration later. And then these two, I've already mentioned, channels for passive transport and pumps for active transport. 
Okay, really quickly, one final diagram that shows the same thing. So here's another uh, image like that, and just to go through, show you a few things. What is that? Well, it's on the outside. looks like it's a protein. It's not going all the way through. That's probably a peripheral protein or extrinsic protein. That could be a hormone binding site, electron carrier, and any one of the things that we mentioned before. Um, what's this? Pointing at the heads right here. Hydrophilic heads of a phospholipid molecule. Uh, they like water, so the water, they're facing the water. What's this? The tails are hydrophobic. They're all pointing inside. Uh, what's this? Here's a channel, a protein channel that could be moving. Oh, can't move. Oh, here we go. That could be moving uh, things all the way through. More on that later. And two more things that weren't in the previous diagram, but are less important in understanding the whole structure of the cell membrane. Uh, cholesterol. Cholesterol is actually important. So these little molecules that I've thrown in there. Cholesterol is important to the structure of the cell membrane. And the more cholesterol you have in there, the less fluid the membrane is, the less these actual uh, phospholipids actually flow around each other. So it determines the fluidity of the membrane. And uh, you can see there's like little flags or kites attached to one of these proteins out here. This could be a glycoprotein. Um, glycoprotein, glyco meaning containing some kind of carbohydrate chain. Sounds like glucose or glycogen. Um, but glycoprotein just means it's a protein. It's like a combination of some carbohydrate plus some protein. It basically functions as a marker to flag a cell, identifying it as a particular type of cell. So a hormone may be looking for a flag like this, but will ultimately, uh, this may help to identify the cell with various kinds of interactions, and then maybe it'll attach to a hormone binding site here. I think that's about it. One final thing to say here, and I'll add it up here, is that sometimes we call this the fluid mosaic. Uh-oh, don't crash. Yes, model. What? The font just changed. The fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. Fluid, because I told you it's dynamic, these things are moving around. Mosaic, because if I view this from the top, if I view this from the top, it looks like there's a bunch of uh, little, little balls around. And it kind of makes a little design, and that, that design is, is constantly uh, moving around. So it looks like mosaic in the sense that there are a bunch of different pieces, and when you look at the top, it looks like uh, there's, a, there's some kind of uh, design or a pattern. Okay, post any questions you have about the general structure of the plasma membrane, not the cell membrane, the plasma membrane. All right.